I had the Good set. Heavens. I had the set specially prepared for you. Wonderful. Norm. How are you? Rob, how great to see you. Great to see you too. How the devil are you? Here we are on stage eight. Did we do Jabba's Palace on it? I do believe we did. I thought amongst we did. many other things. Yeah. And all those endless cockpits that we did. Cockpits. Didn't we? Blue screen. X, blue screen, oh. X wing, and um, yeah. when you were working together in, in these studios making that film, and as Norm has already told us and other people, you had no idea what you were making back in 1976, 77. We had no idea, obviously, that um, what was going to happen with Star Wars would happen. George Lucas had indicated to us that um, if the film was successful, the first one. Uh, we'd make two more <clears throat> and so at the end of shooting we what's known as pack struck some bits of set I Millennium Falcon interior and exterior bits like that that we might use again and we put them in containers on the back lot here at the studio knowing that the following year we were either going to pull them out and use them or pull them out and junk them as luck would have it we pulled them out and used them Norman won an Oscar along with others for that first film, went on to be production designer then for the, the next two Star Wars films and on Raiders etc and, and, and created this incredible impact on the movie industry. What do you make of, of Norman's work? Norman's brilliant at what he does. His um, imagination and eye for set. If you look at say Raiders of the Lost Ark, have a look at that brilliant the way it's all put together in, in, in terms of set and locations and um, obviously the Star Wars as well because Norman you know went on to be one of if not the greatest production designer in the world. In terms of Norman's work we've talked a lot today about Raiders and, and, and Star Wars but obviously he's done Mission Impossible, Superman, Alien 3, all this other stuff as well that people wouldn't normally re have recognised him with. Do you, do you think production designers get, like Norman, get the credit they deserve in the public eye? Not always, no, by no means. You know, it tends to, they tend to emerge into the public eye at times things like Oscar ceremonies and stuff like that. Unless, of course, you're a film buff or a Star Wars fan. Star Wars fans know everything about the film. As I always say to them, you know more about the film than I do. But no, you know, Norman's got the recognition. He's got two Hollywood Oscars plus BAFTAs and all kinds of things, and he thoroughly deserves all of them. But we're not film stars, us behind the camera. <laughs> Um, and so we don't, you know, Ken Adam, who was a famous designer for all those Bond films. I mean, he was brilliant, Ken, and Norman was working with him, obviously, on Thunderball when I was on Thunderball as well. They d don't get quite the same, it's just not the same. But I suppose that's fact because it's actors that people see. But something like Jabba's Palace, would that have taken up the whole stage do you think? Yes, I Considerable think. pieces, yes it would, pretty much. With the, with the X amount of space around for the, uh, the, the crew to operate in. So it, this, this was a convenient sized stage for that set actually, wasn't it? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. I seem to recall the Rancor pit being on one of these stages. Yes it too. was, you were right Robert, I think it was one of them. I can tell you that, so Rancor pit was, <laughs> so I've, I've done my work, I've, uh, here you go, so this was Stage seven. Oh, there's the rancor. Oh, it was on seven. Yeah, stage seven, which was that one over there, uh, next there's door. There's not much to choose between them, really, is there? No. Really, these stages. No, I they're the three remember small remembering ones. This, this uh, set, but um, it was a really uh, frightening experience seeing the rancor appear when um, Luke was he dropped in here, if I remember right. Yes. He was, was dropped in here, wasn't he? Obi Wan Kenobi's house. When the movie was set such a hit, they rushed out all these merchandising that they could do quickly, which were books, t-shirts and stuff, and they brought out a, a book of colour pictures, and they had a shot of Obi-Wan Kenobi's house, and 3 PO is sitting there without the leg on, and with oh, a completely human hand sticking out in yes. the book. <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> you remember that? I wish I, I had it. it there was a, a scene to somewhere or other where he's... 
He started the scene with the, not having the, head, the helmet on. Yes. Do you remember? Yes. Because I think that's really what Tony wanted all along, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so it was more comfortable. It looks like a TV studio now, but just give us a sense of what it would have been like when you were making Star Wars and, and Raiders and, and the big films in the 70s and 80s in here. Well, it was buzzing because you'd have a shooting stage, but Norman had it all going on ahead and behind because they'd be striking the sets we'd finish, they'd be finishing the sets we're about to go on, and everything was laid out in order, you know. There was a, Norman, your s schedule for doing the sets was all based on the shooting schedule. Yes, absolutely, and based on um, the um, availability of actors. That Robert was, uh, had his, uh, his board with all the available dates. So it, the two things have to combine, the, the schedule for the actors and the, uh, the ability to prepare the sets in the time to accommodate them. So sometimes a set that you would see first in the picture would be last in the shooting order, dependent upon the availability of the actors. So, um, in my mind, as a production, it's so big. Shouldn't it be the other way around? They have to fit in with you? It entirely depends, you see, because they're laid out in certain ways to, well, m make them contractually as least expensive as you can. <laughs> And then, of course, you either get actors who sometimes are working in the theatre, so they have to have Wednesday off for the matinee, afternoon off. But um, you also have occasions where once upon a time in my life, I had this occasion with Norman, never happened before, never happened again, I don't think, when I went to him and said, Norman, we're getting ahead of schedule. You'll have to accelerate the sets. Yes, I can't, I can't remember. Can you remember Raiders what the set the was? Dark. Can you remember what I set it was? I can't remember which one it was. I remember you saying that. I said to you, you've got to because Stephen's getting ahead of schedule. And we ended up two weeks ahead of schedule on that. Yes, film. we did. Which Never is, happened before. No. Which is really, they really put in some set, in some ways, puts a spanner in, in the works as far as production is concerned. Everything is geared. Everyone else is running their hands yeah. and making uh, you know, things out as expensive as they might be, but uh, that was unknown really, for, and is unknown for a, a, a it's director to be two weeks two ahead weeks, of schedule. Two weeks on a 17 week schedule, two weeks ahead. I seem to remember there was congratulations in Variety. And Hollywood Reporter. And Hollywood Reporter to, to Steven Spielberg and the, the cast and crew for, uh, of <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ark. And our last day of shooting we finished in Hawaii, which was really nice. Lovely. It's not a bad life, is it? <laughs> you were saying as we were walking up the stairs, one of the joys of the job, I mean, I'm sure there were lots of perks, but you had to go and find locations to shoot these films on and you got to travel the world. Yeah, well, we did. I mean, Norman and I actually uh, circumnavigated the globe twice on Raiders of the Lost Ark. He got on a plane and headed west till we got back to England again. We didn't find anything the first time round, so we so thought we'd have another go. <laughs> <laughs> but you were welcomed, presumably, with open arms in these places, because if a movie uh, moves in, to, it, it, it's, it's great for the local economy. Well, one of the pluses to doing that, really, in, in the, certainly in the States, was they are all welcoming you with open arms, the possibility of shooting a movie there. You were at our disposal, and Robert will confirm this, I'm sure. Um, you were loaned the local the helicopter, the, the governor's helicopter, mm -hmm. or his plane, and the hotel and everything was played for simply to entice you to, to bring the film there. Oh, yes, they're, they're sort of mad keen on... Um getting you in there because it's huge revenue but on top of it it's publicity for the state from a tourism point of view because you know if they, you get a real hit movie and it's shot somewhere it creates tourism do you know how many mm. people go to Tunisia even to this very day because Star Wars was shot there how many I don't know how many <laughs> but I've seen websites I've seen travel agents who advertise tours and the rest of it and of course, the Tunisians didn't even know that then, Norm. They no, didn't not get any of that. But you're right about, you know, the US. That's right. My first experience of Tunisia was with um, John Barry on a film called Little Prince. We shot oh, there, yes. Little Prince, and then subsequently, John suggested shooting Star Wars there. So we went there on Star Wars, shot Star Wars there. As a result of Star Wars, we went there for Raiders and shot Raiders there. So it was a very popular um, location. 
And it's relatively convenient, isn't it? You don't travel the other it's, side of the world. It's, it's only a matter of a couple of hours or so. It's not that far, and there are ferries from Europe where you can put trucks on them and put them over. You know, I mean, when we did Raiders of the Lost Ark, I remember the first question I had before I knew anything about it, not Raiders of the Lost Ark, oh, yes, it, uh, was it Raiders? Yes, was, do we see the pyramids or the Nile? And they said, no. I said, well, that's good. We don't have to go to Egypt. Then. <laughs> yes. Because the place we shot Caruan, you know, is Cairo. Yes, I do remember. Caruan, the name of it, actually means Little Cairo. So in no. terms of the, the production process when you were getting involved, a director comes to you for the, for the film you're working, you've scouted the location, but in terms of actually getting from the director's idea to filming in a studio like this, what's the process, Norman? Well, the process really is... Um you have to find out whether uh, uh, organising a meeting with the director and, and essentially it's really to find out whether he's a, a visual director or whether he's more concerned about the actors. So having established he's a visual director, hopefully, and have a, has a sense of what he'd like to see, um, I extract those ideas and then go away and do some drawings, the drawings that you've, you've already seen, and then um, would apply that really to the stage that you're going to use. I had plans of all the stage spaces and I would do a preliminary drawing of the size of the set, the plan view of the set, so you could allocate the, the, the space in a stage such as this. And then um, from that same drawing, these, the construction people would actually set out the, the size of the set with lines on the floor and uh, so on and start building it. And uh, I would then have to um, monitor that to see if I'd made some terrible mistake and nip it in the bud, hopefully, if it was. But um, that's basically, in simple terms, how the original thing starts in that sort of way, establishing the ideas from the director. And some directors are really concerned. One of the best people to work with, I found, was Stephen, who had a, oh. a very, very broad... Um, idea of what he would wanted and I think when I'm very cool rightly when I met him for the interview for this film Raiders he said I want some big funhouse Disney sets he said go away and do that for me and that was his basic brief which um, is broad to say the least but he's his philosophy and I think it's a particularly American attitude really which is very refreshing is you say you can do the job go away and do it and you did have fun on that film. The oh, sets were we massive. Had fun. We had fun. And yeah. Stephen was, you know, he's brilliant to work with because he's so creative. He's challenging, isn't he? He challenges you. Absolutely. And the rest of it. And as I say, on Raiders, we had this added problem of getting ahead of schedule, of schedule all the time. But it wasn't a problem, no. Having the brilliant Norman Reynolds, it wasn't a problem. It might have been with somebody else, but it wasn't with Norman. <laughs> and we made it. Let's talk about Raiders a bit, and there's, there's so many iconic scenes that you've both worked on, but let, let's talk about that scene leading up to the boulder. But, Norm, first of all, that, that set is, is such an iconic um, scene from a movie now where Indy grabs the, uh, the idol and he legs it down with all the arrows coming out. What was, what was that like to work on in design? Well, that, that was... Um, I'd never done anything like that before, and I, I, I arranged for... Um, when Stephen came over to show him the part of the set that we'd already built, which involved the, the boulder and a, a, quite a long section of the ramp. And that was important to show him how the, the ball and the speed the ball, the boulder rolled down at. So do you remember the meeting, Robert? We were all there at, in the stage. And <coughs> uh, I said to Robert, uh, to um, Stephen, I'll just show you how this boulder works because I wasn't sure whether he'd like it or not. So there were various people scattered around the stage. Steve. And we said, OK, to the... Uh, special effects man um, let's try rolling the ball so you roll the ball down and we all stood by watch the ball roll down and there was a small figure at the end of the track it who was Robert Watts Stephen asked me to run in front of it <laughs> and so I stood out there and this bowl cut you know, it had like scaffold poles out on either side I remember it was fiberglass right Yes, it was. It came rolling me. down like this, and I see it running, and I run in front of it as Stephen has asked me. I get to the end of the run, and there's some two by fours across the end of the set, so I kind of jump over them, and, and the ball stops. 
And Stephen says, OK, I'll, I'll say to you after that. I said, you could have stopped it, couldn't you, Lord? But you said no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a close call then. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's a bit of fun, you know. At least I said I was the first person to run in front of the ball. You were indeed, without yeah. any doubt. Were you pleased with that set? I mean, it, it looks spectacular on film. Well, that, the, the, the action helped, the, the size of the ball and all that stuff. And the whole the whole temple though with the arrows coming out of the wall and the floor and you throw me the idol I threw you the whip and all of that it was a, such a great wasn't it yes a gritty uh, gritty fun fun set and it reminded me of some of the early biblical pictures that, pictures that we saw in the uh, when would it be the fifties yes like Exodus and those sort yes. of things where these you see some of these traps that were uh, they probably inspired the uh, the writing for the for the temple, I suppose. It was brilliant what Norman did. I mean, all these arrows shooting out and the rest of it. You know, if you hit, if you've stepped on the wrong thing, well, on the way back, of course, he's just running like hell. Yes, that's right. <laughs> to get out. Do you remember when we um, we were, were in Mexico and we went to the anthropological museum? Yes. And we actually, I saw this figure. Yes. That was the fertility figure. Yes. That we. I altered slightly. There's a bit of a cheat there, really. Well, what we did, we bought, we were staying in a hotel by Mexico City Airport, and in the tourist shop there were souvenirs, and there was one of those. And That's you right. bought it. Yes, I did. Um, of this fertility symbol, Mayan fertility symbol. And that turned into the Golden Idol. The Golden yes, Idol. That was it's altered. The, it was the right size because of um, Indy having to pick it up and so on, and throwing it and all that stuff. So it was ideal. Um, artifact that I, I had in mind something else actually that was bigger and not quite as interesting so that really was a um, we charged upon the right thing there was, we were very fortunate it's a woman giving birth you see and that's why it's so great uh, the, the key with any sort of set then from what you're saying is you, you, you have to get, take inspiration and reference from, from other stuff as well stuff can come off the top of your head but reference and inspiration is really important well it gives you that layer of reality that I may not have thought of I'm sure I wouldn't have thought of that actually might have been a bit too embarrassed it, but it really really worked for the film it was brilliant you know and it doesn't look like the Mayan one it's, it does but it doesn't does it because it's smaller it's sort of that's right and it's uh Gold, purportedly it's gold. gold. If, if we're talking about raiders and, and big sets, we've got to talk about the Well of Souls and, and, and the snakes and everything as well, because <laughs> I mean that's that's a challenge. You, you've got a, a huge set as well, and well, that, that was the the biggest set I've ever been involved with, really, because it actually yes. went from the floor to the ceiling. It was secured at the bottom, fixed at the top, the and the thing when it, you know, he, Harrison's on that, on the Anubis figure, yes, Anubis figure. And, I mean, it was massive. Well, the, the, good, the good thing about that really was that the fact that it was multicolored, like black, gold, um, and the shape of the thing lent itself for p people climbing all over it. Marin was hanging from it, wasn't she, when we saw the snakes? That's right. Yeah. Look out, it's full of snakes down there, he said, didn't he? Yes. Um, and the fact that it's uh, lent he, itself to... He goes, snakes, you go first, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which he did. Which he did. Uh, but talking of the snakes, I mean, Robert, you can probably tell this story as well, but there weren't enough snakes originally. Is it true that Stephen wanted more well, and more? it's actually on the documentary of the making of Raiders, uh, because it's, there's a massive documentary on that, because we had a documentary crew with us every single day of shooting on that film. And there is a shot in the thing where, where you see Stephen saying, get Robert down here, we need more snakes. So there I am, come along, and Stephen says, we need more snakes. So I said, all right, Stephen, how many? Well, about another 3,000 or something. I mean, these are real <coughs> snakes we're talking about here. And I think there could still be some in the drains. I in think Gorham there Wood. probably can. There's a thing called a glass snake. They're not poisonous at all. It sounds like grass snake in English. It's glass, actually. And the guy who was providing all our animals, a guy called Mike Cullen, you remember Mike? I do remember him well. And uh, so I went to Mike and said, Mike, we need more snakes. They were in the next day, Amsterdam. From so Holland. Holland, I remember that from Holland, That's yes. the big place in Europe for zoo animals. And you got them the next day? go there and say, I want 3,000 glass snakes. It was like... The next day, it was less than two days I had them in the studio. They're quick breeders. Very. <laughs>